Welcome everyone to this week's edition of the Extracellular Vesicle Club. Uh, so this, this, uh, this rendition of the EV Club is going to be a collaboration between ISEV and Socrates, which is the Singapore Society uh, for EVs. And I'm very pleased to introduce Wei Xiang To, who is going to introduce in turn our speaker, who is going to be very familiar to many of you. Um, so Wei Xiang, thank you for joining us. And um, I'm going to hand it over to you. All right, thanks, Ken. Yeah, so this is uh, Wei Xiong To from uh, NUS, and today is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Ming Lei. So Dr. Ming Lei uh, received her PhD from uh, Singapore MIT Alliance and her postdoctoral training from Harvard Medical School. And uh, she is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Pharmacology and Institute for Digital Medicine at NUS. She also serves as an Associate Editor for Journal of Extra Cell Vesicles and a Deputy Editor for Journal of Extra Cell Vesicle, Extra Cell Biology. Her main research interests involve the development of extra cell vesicle based drug delivery system for cancer development. And today she is joined by her uh, research fellow, uh, Dr. Peng Boya, and also student uh, Jay. And uh, today they will share with us uh, their latest research progress on engineered red blood cell derived extra cell vesicles as efficient vectors for targeted RNA delivery. All right, so over to you, Ming Lei. Thank you so much, Ken and Wei Xiong, for the Thai introduction. Um, I'm Ming Lei, I'm very uh, happy to speak today together with um, Boya and Jay from my lab. We're working on engineer red blood cells um, for targeted delivery of RNA therapeutics. And as a disclaimer, I'm a scientific advisor and um, co-founder of Kamai Therapeutics. So let me start with um, nucleic acid modalities for the next generation of medicine. I guess you are very familiar with um, mRNA vaccines since it has been used for COVID-19 preventions. There are also other type of RNA therapeutics, and you, you may uh, well familiar with sRNA, microRNA, antisense oligonucleotide, and guiRNA CRISPR-Cas9. These are um, programmable RNA to target disease gene with high specificity and flexibility. But it's not easy to deliver them into the cells because they, they don't cross the cell membrane by themselves. So we often need to modify them and use the carrier to deliver them into the cells. Now, they are already existing um, carrier system for therapeutic RNA, such as viral vectors and lipid nanoparticle, but they have various limitations. Virus are normally immunogenic. AIV have limited payload capacity, while uh, lentivirus has reach of insertional metagenesis. In general, it's quite challenging to manufacture virus in large scale. Lipid nanoparticles may overcome most of these limitations, but they have their own problem. They often have limited bar distribution. They have toxicity in the liver at high doses, and they may have low um, efficient, um, efficiency of endosomal escape. So we need some alternatives for anti-therapeutic delivery. Um, extracellular physical could be a good alternative because these are nature delivery vehicle. We know that extracellular physical are very important for intercellular communication because they help us to exchange protein, RNA, DNA, lipid um, from one cell and other cells. So these physicals can be very good delivery system for um, therapeutic um, such as RNA and other type of molecule. AVs are biocompatible. Most of them are non-toxic and non-immunogenic. This feature has attracted a lot of attention from the biotech world with a lot of investment into startup companies such as Korea Biosciences and Evo Therapeutics to develop extracellular physicone for drug delivery. Especially these two companies focus on nucleic acid therapies, but there's still a lot of challenges in the field to develop EVs for therapeutic purpose. Because 
we need to scale up the production of EVs. We often need billions of cells to produce enough EVs for a single human dose. Therefore, we need some cells that um, can, can be pro produced in massive scale. Um, we often use cell light because they can expand in culture, but cell light most of risk of oncogenesis because they can export oncogenic components into extracellular physical. And this component can transform recipient cells. It's safer to use primary cells. And we think that red blood cells is an ideal source for extracellular physical. Firstly, it's safe because red blood cell has no DNA, so no risk of oncogenesis and genetic material transfer. Secondly, it's sustainable because red blood cells is the most abundant cell type in our body, and it can be easily obtained from the blood bank. It's scalable to produce EV from red blood cells because we can induce massive release of EVs in an economical fashion. We have shown in this paper that we can produce massive release of EVs from red blood cells using calcium minus four with around 1,000 times higher yield than from cell life. This is the protocol that we use to produce red blood cell EVs. It's established by my student, Wakas in Tin, where we started with whole blood. We separated red blood cells, then incubated them with calcium mineral for overnight. We then separate cell and debris using low speed centrifugation and concentrated EVs using ultra centrifugation, including a step with sucrocution to remove the protein contamination. And here we got uh, very few RBC EVs. The size range from 100 to 300 nanometer, but most of them are around 150 to 170 nanometer. You can see that they appear intact and clean under an electron microscope. They contain um, several markers of extracellular vesicles that are at least in the SC101. They have a lot of protein from red blood cells as hemoglobin. Uh, um, glycophorin A and stomatin. We can load EVs with um, RNA using electroporation. This is a traditional method. And in this paper, we use this method to start with. Um, when we loaded EVs with an antisense oligonucleotide against an oncogenic microRNA called Mu125B. So by suppressing Mu125B, we can suppress tumor growth in a breast cancer model. In this experiment, we injected EVs with ASO directly into the tumor. And you can see a clear effect here. But we can also deliver EVs in a systemic manner by IV injection of EVs in this leukemia model. We could use this method to deliver e, um, ASO in the EVs and suppress um, the tumor growth in this leukemia model. So this study suggests that we can use RBC EVs for robust delivery of therapeutic RNA in a scalable and safe manner. And we observe that the EVs are taken up by different organs. Here, when we label the EVs with fluorescence, we observe that they are taken up a lot by the liver, stomach, intestine, spleen when we injected them IP. They are taken up also by multiple cell types in each of these organs. So how do we make this uptake more specific so that they can accumulate more in the target cells and other cells? Therefore, we thought of using um, some conjugation method to add targeting moiety onto the EV surface. Traditionally, um, there are methods to modify the host genes um, to produce EVs with this targeting moiety. But red blood cells are not suitable for genetic engineering because they do not have the nuclear, they don't have DNA. So we have to modify EVs after we isolate them from red blood cells. Uh, there are also methods for lipid insertion, chemical conjugation, and affinity-based interaction to conjugate EVs. But this has various limitations. Therefore, we develop our own method to modify EVs using an enzyme called protein ligase or OAP ligase. This method allows us to conjugate EVs with peptide and antibody for targeted delivery so that this EV could bind to specific receptor. For example, here, 
we have a pet target targeting EGFR. We added a ligase binding site so that a ligase could act on this peptide and create a covalent bond between the peptide and GL on uh, membrane protein on EVs. With this, we could obtain about 380 peptides per EV. This co covalent bond is very stable. And the method is very gentle. It doesn't affect um, the EV properties. It's also very efficient. So with the EGFR targeting peptide, we observe an increased accumulation of EVs in the lung um, of mice that has EGFR positive lung cancer. When we loaded these EVs with um, buckley tech cells, we observed an increase in treatment efficacy when the EV was targeted to EGFR um, expressing cells in the lung cancer model. So now we we're trying to improve this method further to increase the conjugation efficiency and um, conjugate antibody with higher copy number. And we also try to load RNA into the EV um, at higher efficiency. So in this paper that we published in Keranosics this year, we describe a better method, some improvement in coupling um, surface modification of EVs and RNA loading for therapeutic delivery and also with some therapeutic peptide. And this paper was written by Jamie Guerra, um, Marco Pirisinu, and um, Yuki Yang in my lab. Today I have Jay here with me. Um, he's a PhD student in my lab. Actually, he's a first year PhD student, but he has several um, very excellent paper because he has worked in our lab as an undergraduate student um, for a long time. And um, he has also won the Young Investigator Award from ISAF last year. So now, uh, please welcome Jay. Thank you, Dr. Le. Um, so uh, for this project, we actually wanted to target CXCR4, uh, which is a commonly overexpressed marker in CXCR4 uh, in uh, leukemic cells. So we utilized a cyclic T140 peptide uh, known as T140. And what we found out early on in our experiment was that the T140 peptide uh, was ligated much more efficiently than the linear peptides that we previously had been using in our studies. Uh, so for comparison, here you see a Western blot where we assessed the ligation efficiency of biotinylated forms of cyclic BT140 or BTL5 linear peptides. And the Western blot and uh, competition ELISA revealed that on average, we got between three to four times higher copy number with the cyclic peptide, of course, while maintaining the stable, irreversible, and efficient nature of conjugation. Uh, we also wanted, I mean, thus far, uh, we had never assessed our ligation efficiency on a single EV resolution. So we assessed, uh, uh, we conducted nano flow sedimentary analysis using a nano FCM system on peptide ligated or unligated EVs. Uh, for this experiment, we once again utilized biotinylated peptides, which were ligated uh, using the same OAP ligase. And we stained them using Spectrudin 488 and uh, analyzed uh, ligation efficiency using uh, the nano FCM system. Of course, you see on the two plots on the left, we have the reagent control and PBS only. You don't see any uh, distinct EV population. Addition of EVs or EVs only uh, incubated with the peptide in the absence of the enzyme does not result in a significant increase in fit fluorescence uh, shown on the y axis. Uh, so all the EVs, you see a distinct population in Q3, the lower right quadrant. However, upon ligation with the peptide, either the linear or the cyclic peptide, we see a clear shift of the majority of the EV population into this upper right quadrant, the Q2 quadrant, indicating efficient ligation of the majority of the EVs. Of course, we wanted to ensure that, uh, we wanted to ensure that these EVs, uh, the events in Q2 were actually EVs and not artifacts. So we did a Tritonex lysis where in Tritonex was added into the same sample and reanalyzed, as you can see on the plot on the far right here. And you see uh, the EV events in the, the events in Q2 shift back to Q1, indicating that the events that contributed to Q2 were actually lipid bound vesicles. Uh, it should be noted also that the flow sedimentary analysis when assessed using mean fluorescence also revealed that the BT140 peptide 
had higher, two to three times higher fluorescence uh, than the linear peptide BTL5. Uh, of course, that was just for targeting. So the T140 peptide was shown to be able to increase uptake in CXCR, uptake of EVs by CXCR4 positive cells. So the co-first author of this, of, of this paper, Marco, he came up with this idea of conjugating the pro-apoptotic KLA peptide onto the side chain of lysine on the T140 peptide. And here we get a bifunctional peptide where the T140 domain in green is capable of binding to CXCR4, while the KLA domain is capable of inducing apoptosis. And when we conducted an actin 5 PIS and apoptosis assay on CXCR4 positive molin protein cells, we see that uh, not only are the EVs taken up higher, uh, the T140 or T140KLA peptide ligated EVs taken up more by these CXCR4 positive cells but it leads to the increased delivery of the KLA peptide to these cells, resulting in increased apoptosis as evidenced by the increased uh, uh, annexin 5 signal shown here. Moving in vivo, we were also able to demonstrate that the bifunctional T140 KLA EVs resulted in greater suppression of AML progression, uh, here shown using a molem 13 xenograph, uh, as compared to either of the monovalent peptide ligated EVs, either T140 EV or KLA EV. And a similar effect was shown on uh, survival of the same uh, more than 13 centigrade mice, wherein uh, the bifunctional peptide resulted in improved survival of the more than 13 centigrade mice. Of course, thus far, uh, we have only been conjugating peptides. And peptides are, for the most part, limited in uh, functionality and versatility. So, for this, uh, we want uh, to solve this problem. We wanted to see if we could conjugate antibodies, which would afford a degree of versatility. Uh, so we developed this uh, conjugation approach wherein we still started off by ligating a biotinylated peptide onto the EV using the same enzyme, which we followed up by, by sequential incubation with streptovidin, a tetrameric uh, protein, and a biotinylated antibody of choice. And what we see here is that the tetrameric streptovidin is able to bind both the biotin on the EV and biotin, biotin molecules on the antibody, or antibody which we want to be conjugated on the EV. And of course, streptovidin is one of the most stable interactions. Uh, and this could result in stable, almost irreversible conjugation. And we did quantify the proper number of uh, various antibodies, monoclonal antibodies and VHHs or single domain antibodies. And depending on the nature of the antibody, we get between 280 to 330 copies of antibody per EV. We also assessed uh, the conjugation efficiency of monoclonal antibodies onto the EV using single EV flow cytometric analysis, once again, using a nano FCM system, and confirmed that we were able to efficiently conjugate antibodies to the majority of the EV population. Uh, of course, uh, in addition to maintaining stable and efficient and site-specific conjugation, the, what is important here is that this approach is versatile in that this biotinylated antibody can be uh, replaced with any protein, a biotinylated protein of choice. Uh, so we next wanted to determine if we could use this uh, approach to increase targeted delivery of EVs. So we conjugated a single domain antibody against EGFR, also called uh, here as EGFR VHH. And we assessed uptake in a co-culture system consisting of parent cell 41 cells that did not express human EGFR and TD2 uh, 41 TD2 matter human EGFR double positive cells shown here in red. And what we were able to observe was that the non-targeted treatment did show basal levels of uptake in both cell lines, uh, but you don't see any discriminate uptake in any particular cell line. Whereas if you were to go uh, look at the EGFR VHH conjugated EVs on the far right panel, you see significantly higher accumulation of EVs shown here in green in the TD2 matter human EGFR double positive cells. And you don't see this preferential accumulation in the EGFR negative cells indicating uh, successful and efficient targeting towards EGFR positive cells. At the same time, we were working on methods to load RNA into EVs. We explored, of course, a more conventional electroporation, along with the use of exogenous transfectins, including exofect, 
and reg one. We first assess the loading efficiency using a fan conjugated ASO. So you, here you have a negative control that the ASO was simply incubated with the EV. And you do see a loading uh, of the fan ASO with all three methods, though the transfections XFS and reg one resulted in generally much higher loading efficiency as compared to electroporation. Similar results were also seen for in vitro delivery of the same fan ASO, as you can see on the panel on the right, where reg one and XFX gave the best in vitro delivery. Uh, we also assess in vitro delivery using flow cytometric analysis. Once again, we see the same trend of the transfection, the XFX and reg one resulting in much higher intracellular delivery as compared to electroporation. Uh, importantly, none of the methods investigated in this study resulted in significant loss of viability, as you can see on the panel here. Uh, so we decided to go uh, to further investigate XFX and reg one loading, and we very we uh, quantified the loading efficiency as compared to the total RNA input, and we were able to ascertain that between seventy to ninety percent, depending on the transfection of choice, were was we were able to load between seventy to ninety percent of the input RNA into the EVs, uh, and we also conducted. Uh, Functional, uh, functional knockdown assays where we loaded an antisense oligonucleotide against mid 5 b and assessed knockdown in CA1A breast cancer cells. And what we were able to see was that both the exogenous transfections, XFX and REG1, resulted in uh, significant knockdown of mid 5 b uh, We also performed physical chemical characterization using TEM and NTA. TEM revealed that neither of the methods revealed, resulted in uh, significant loss of uh, membrane integrity or aggregation. However, NTA did reveal that uh, electroporated EVs did lose uh, to some degree uh, the a change resulting in a change in the size distribution profile as evidenced by the shift towards the right indicating a larger size of a larger, pro a pro a larger proportion of larger aggregated EVs. Uh, however, for the most part, work one particularly an X effect did not uh, show this uh, the uh, effect of aggregation. And in general, REG1 and XFX resulted in the greatest loading efficiency and functional delivery while retaining the EV integrity and resulting in minimal aggregation. We further assessed uh, more, uh, uh, in more detail uh, the ASO loaded EVs using these transfections. So here we uh, quantified the absolute number of RNA molecules loaded per EV using REG1. Here, using RTQPCR or native page, we were able to confirm that uh, we got an estimate of between 450 with RTQPCR or 510 molecules of RNA on average per EV. Uh, we also conducted single EV flow cytometric analysis. And once again, we were able to show, demonstrate that simply incubation of the FAM ASO with the EVs did not result in significant in loading of the ASO into the EVs while reg one uh, 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 transfection was able to load uh, the majority of these, in this case, 95% of the EVs. And we see a very homogeneous uh, profile of the EVs that have been loaded with the FAM ASO. Um, so we, uh, once we had developed the targeting approach and RNA loading approach, we combined them. And here we uh, conjugated EVs with a VHH, a single domain antibody against EGFR and loaded them with DGFP siRNA and assessed a knockdown efficacy using a CA1A DGFP cell line. And here you do see a minor level of knockdown of DGFP in the CA1A cells with non-targeted or control EVs. However, it is only in the presence of EGFR targeting do you see almost complete knockdown of the DGFP reporter indicating that this platform in combination is able to result in uh, the increased delivery of functional RNA cargo into cells. Uh, we repeated this once again using mir one to 5 b ASO. Uh, ASO again is a common oncogenic microRNA that is overexpressed in certain breast cancer cell lines. So here we have human CA1A breast cancer cells where uh, we were able to demonstrate that non-targeted EVs once again result only in modest levels of knockdown while the targeted EVs loaded with mir one to 5 b ASO result in significant mir one to 5 knockdown, almost log fold higher, resulting in greater decreases in cell viability. 
It is important to note here that EVs loaded with NCASO using the similar transactant, or EVs simply incubated with the ASO, or, e or the ASO simply incubated with Reg1 only in the absence of EVs, was unable to uh, demonstrate significant knockdown or loss of viability. And a similar trend was seen with the 41 mouse breast cancer cells. Uh, moving in vivo, we wanted to utilize a breast cancer model which metastasized to the lung. And we uh, aimed to deliver the EVs intratracheally. So we first verified this method of the EV delivery. Uh, we labeled EVs with CFSC, administered them into a mouse, and sectioned uh, the mouse lung and a certain the level of uh, the permeation of the EV through the lung and how well the EV was able to uh, reach the different uh, extremities of the lung. And we see quite, quite a homogeneous distribution for the most part with uh, quite a significant level of coverage up to 20% even in the lower extremities of the mouse lung. Uh, we next uh, wanted to verify our targeting approach in vivo. So we established a 41 tube tomato human EGFR stenograph uh, allograph um, in, uh, in, the, in the mice where the cells were injected intravenously, wherein they were able to metastasize to the lung and form micrometastasis. And a few uh, two days later, we administered uh, CFSC labeled EVs intratracheally with or without the EGFR VHH. And what we were able to ob observe was that we see significantly high colocalization of the green EV signal shown here with the red TD2 matter reporter from the tumor cells only in the presence of the targeting EGFR VHH uh, conjugated on the EV, uh, indicating that our targeting approach is in fact functional in vivo. Uh, we also did uh, as a, a single experiment to determine if a similar effect could be observed for functional knockdown. Uh, because when you're knocking down mirror one to five B, it is essential that you knock it down in the tumor cells and not as much in the lung cells. So here we uh, uh, administered mir one to 5 b ASA loaded EVs with or without targeting uh, to mice bearing 41 td 2 meta human EGFR allograph. And uh, we then homogenized the lung, uh, sorted the lung cells from the tumor cells, and it's just knocked down in these two cell populations. And what we were able to see, what we were able to see was that we see significantly higher knockdown, more than a log, log fold higher in the tumor cells as opposed to the lung cells in the targeted treatment, while the non-targeted treatments and the targeted treatment knockdown in the lung cells only showed basal levels uh, of very modest knockdown. Uh, we then repeated uh, in vivo treatment where the mice were treated every day for six days, the mice were sacrificed on day seven and assessed for tumor burden. Uh, using flow cytometric, flow cytometric analysis on the left or immunofluorescent imaging for TD2 matter on the right. And we were able to demonstrate that the targeted treatment consistently uh, resulted in lower tumor burden, a greater suppression of the metastasis as compared to the non-targeted treatment, while NCASO loaded EVs with or without targeting had no significant effect on slowing down tumor progression. And here you have representative immunofluorescent images of parasitical lung sections from targeted or non-targeted mir one to 5 ASA loaded EV treatments. And here you see that the metastatic regions in the targeted treatment are much smaller. And you also see lower CD31 expression indicating greater tumor suppression as compared to the control uh, VHH ligated EVs. We also lastly wanted to verify that our conjugated EVs did not cause any toxicity. So we uh, assessed them for hemolytic potential uh, and also uh, the uh, upregulation of certain protein markers that could indicate liver toxicity or uh, renal toxicity. And what was important here was that with or without the ligation of a peptide uh, or a VHH, we do not see significant upregulation as compared to a mock CBS injection in either of the parameters tested here. We also verified at least on an acute scale if our EVs were inflammatory. We assessed uh, IL-6 and TNF, uh, TNF concentration using a LIFA and assess markers of uh, inflammation in the liver, such as IL-6, interferons, and other associated genes. And once again, we do not see a significant difference uh, of our EV treatment as compared to a mock injection of CBS. And this indicates our EVs are non-toxic and non-inflammatory, at least on the short-term scale. 
And now we have Boya who will uh, explain, uh, who will discuss her work on applying this EngineerDB platform for therapeutic use. Thank you, Jay. So um, I will continue to talk about the application of RBC EVs for targeted delivery of free agonist in anti-cancer immunotherapy. This work has been published in the Journal of Extracellular Vesicles. We have seen in many cl clinical trials that not all cancer patients respond to immune checkpoint inhibitors because they have cold tumors that are in infiltrated by immune suppressive cells. Therefore, we need to turn the cold tumors to a hot microenvironment by inflaming the tumors with T cells and other immune activators so that the tumors can be more responsive to immunotherapy. A promising approach to enhance the immune responses is to find the RIGA pathway. RIGA is a cytosolic sensor which recognizes double-stranded RNA coupled with 5 prime triphosphates. It consequently activates the signaling pathway and induces interferon release, turning the tumors from cold to hot. We collaborate with Dr. L uh, Prof. Dr. Uh, Prof. Loda has group from K uh, LKC Medicine. They have validated a potent RIG agonist named immunomodulatory RNA that has pyrpantra phosphate and a helping secondary structure with high binding affinity to RIG receptor. Jay has shown that uh, REC1 and EXOFACT are capable of loading RNA into EVs efficiently. Here we loaded IMM RNA into EVs using these two transfectants. So we uh, observed similar effects uh, in rig activation shown by upregulation of DDX58, the gene encoding rig I, and other downstream genes in CL1A cells. As a control, EVs with the transfectants, IMM RNA complex with the transfectants, or EVs loaded with NCRNA using the transfectants did not have this effect. We repeated this experiment in mouse breast cancer 41 cells and human CL1A cells. We confirmed that only IMM Manelo the EVs could induce RIG activation in the cells. To assess the interferon producing activity, we used two cell lines that express a luciferous reporter gene under the control of um, interferon stimulated promoter and elements. So as you can see, the IMM RNA of the EVs could induce the production of, the, of interference in the wild type cells. In rig and knockout cells, this effect was completely abrogated, in, uh, suggesting that uh, rig is the primary sense of IMM, IMM RNA in the cells. This data was also associated with the increased level of interferon alpha and interferon beta, as well as pro-inflammatory cytokine, tnf alpha, and interleukin-6 secreted by 41 cells in the cultured supernatant. We also observed that the IMM manilo the EVs could induce apoptosis in these two cell lines. In addition to IMM RNA, we developed another RIG agonist. It is a bifunctional antisense oligonucleotide that is complementary to oncogene mu 125 b so it can knock down mu 125 b It is modified with 5 prime triphosphates, so it can trigger rig activation. This was tested in 41 cells and C1A cells. It also induced apoptosis in these two cell lines. To validate the effect of IMM on the EVs in breast cancer in vivo, we used an other topic um, cancer model by injecting 41 cells in the memory fat pad of RBC mice. We treated the mice with IMM on the EVs intratumorally every three days. We found that the treatment effectively suppressed the tumor growth by triggering rig activation in the cells and inducing cell apoptosis in the tumors shown by tunnel assay. It also increased the infiltration of immune cells into the tumors, including neutrophils, neutrophilia cells, macrophages, dendritic cells, and T cells, particularly CD8 T cells, suggesting the shift of the tumor microenvironment from cold to hot. 
we observed the same effects of the bifunctional acyl low DEVs in the uh, mouse breast cancer model. The bifunctional ASO functioned as a mu 5 b suppressor and an immune activator, showing potent effects in tumor suppression. We have shown that a uh, rig agonist can be delivered by RBCEVs to primary breast cancer cells, where they trigger rig activation and induce interferon release, therefore enhancing anti-tumor immunity. On the other hand, metastasis is responsible for the vast majority of breast cancer patient death. To treat metastatic breast cancer, we applied the EV surface functionalization approach as Jay introduced to conjugate each of our nanobody onto EV surface. As you can see, the conjugation of EVs with each of our nanobody increased the delivery of IMMRNA to each of our positive cells to treat the activation. To validate the targeted delivery of EVs to metastatic breast cancer, 41 cells expressing EGFR were injected in the tail vein and then colorized in the lung. We delivered severely leveled EVs directly to the lung through intrapulmonary administration. So as you can see, the conjugation of EVs with EGFR nanobody promoted EV uptake by tumor cells. The EVs were also taken up by other cell types. However, there was no change in the uptake rate. We subsequently treated lung metastasis using IM the EVs through intrapulmonary administration. As a consequence, the IM the EVs effectively suppressed the percentage of tumor cells and metastatic area in the lungs especially when the EVs were conjugated with EGFR nanobodies. That is due to the activation of RIGA pathway and the induction of cell apoptosis in the lungs, as well as the increased immune cell infiltration. Surprisingly, we found an elimination of alveolar macrophages due to the treatment of IMMRNA. Alveolar macrophages serve as the primary recipient source of EVs in the airway. The depletion of alveolar macrophages would pave the way of EVs to reach tumor cells more easily, therefore enhancing anti-tumor efficacy. We looked into immune activation in detail where we found that IM of the EVs promoted identity cell activation and M1 macrophage proliferation. In addition, IM of the EVs, especially the EVs conjugated with EGFR nanobody, Potentiate CD8 T cell activity by upregulating CD69 and grand B in the cells. It also augmented the production of interferon gamma, which is associated with a significant increase in cytotoxic T cell activity. To conclude here, the EGFR targeted RBC EVs deliver IMMA to metastatic breast cancer cells to trigger reactivation and induce interferon release thereby activating effector T cells to produce grand B and interferon gamma to kill the cancer cells. Uh, please let me summarize what we have presented today. Um, we have demonstrated that IBC EVs are safe, efficient, and scalable carriers for RNA therapeutics. These EVs can be conjugated with peptides and nanobody or other antibodies using protein ligase that creates stable covalent bonds. The conjugation help us to increase the specific uptake of EVs by cancer cells in vitro and in vivo. This EV can be loaded with RNA using REC1 or exophate, and we can use it to deliver brick eye agonists to cancer cells for activation of brick eye and increase the immune responses against cancer progression. We can also incorporate anti-cell oligonucleotide sequence into the RIGI agonist for oncology knockdown. With this platform, we are developing therapeutic RNA delivery for several types of cancer, that is leukemia, lung cancer, breast cancer. We also treat cancer cacacia, and we target viral RNA for COVID-19 treatment. Please um, take a look at our paper that we have published on this topic. And with that, I would like to 
and here and thanks my research group and all the alumni as well as our collaborator in Singapore and overseas as well as all the funding agency who support our research. Thank you and I'm happy to take any question. Thank you Ming, thank you. Thank you Ming, uh, Jay and also Boya for sharing this uh, very exciting talk. And uh, I just want to start off with uh, the questions in the chat box. And uh, just feel free to, uh, if you have any further questions, you can also key into the chat box. So maybe I will just uh, start off with uh, the question from uh, En Yu. So can you share with us what is the volume and cell number of uh, the input RBC uh, for the RBC EV production? Uh, that's a good question. I, um, so when we, we use IBCs, um, we actually get the whole unit of blood that is around 450 ml. And that provides us about 10 to the power of 12 cells. Or, um, no, it provides 10 to the power of 14. No, I mean 10 to the power of 14 um, particles or EVs. All right, so that, that is really a lot of uh, EB that could be generated from the RBC. And uh, moving on to another question from uh, Oscar. Uh, could you please elaborate on uh, REC1 and why is it this much better than EH operation for loading? Uh, REC1 and also the Exoflex, those are the commercial reagents, right? And uh, yes, yeah. based on your data, for transfection, they are better than electroporation. Yes, so I think they are better than electroporation because um, they they don't uh, lead to aggregation of EVs um, or very little ag aggregation compared to uh, electroporation. Uh, for electroporation, um, is seen work very well for small RNA, and we have to break up the clump. Uh, by by patting up and down, we also incubate the EVs after electroporation on ice for some time. So we still use electroporation um, in the lab because it, it doesn't involve any additional chemicals. So the advantage mm. of electroporation is that you don't have to worry about any lack of a chemical. Mm, mm. But the right one in Exofac uh, can load more RNA into EVs and it, it seems to mediate delivery better. I see, yeah. So the next question is uh, quite interesting. Uh, so could you comment on uh, the effect of the EGFR targeting RBC EV on non-tumor cells that also express EGFR? Yeah, so what we, uh, what we do see is, of course, a lot of the tumor cells do have uh, unnaturally high levels of EGFR, so that's one thing to take note. Uh, so they are significantly higher than uh, you would find in a normal cell. Uh, which is because most of them are usually dependent on uh, the overexpression of the receptor. But what we also see is like, uh, at least in the model that we use here, uh, we, our nanobody is specific for human EGFR. So that's one thing to take note of the data here. Uh, the single domain antibody is very specific to human EGFR and it cannot bind the recognized amount of EGFR. Uh, but of course, uh, if you were to use uh, mouse EGFR, maybe you would see uh, some binding, but what we see is at least the tumor cells that tumor models we use in our study, we see uh, much, uh, like I said before, experience like very high levels of uh, EGFR as compared to like the normal lung cells because we did, uh, saw the cells here, I think we did the uh, uh, knockdown here. Yeah, so here, uh, so once again here, but of course here our 41 has Human 41 cells have been exogenously expressed uh, with uh, transfused with human EGFR. Uh, but even so, if you look at the mouse lung cells, you don't see such high levels of EGFR. Like mouse EGFR is generally not so high. Uh, of course, like the data we presented, at least for the most part here, we are targeting human EGFR in a mouse. Uh, so we don't see, you wouldn't see uh, the, uh, the uh, whatever off target or uh, targeted to uh, normal cells, you wouldn't really see that effect. Yeah, yeah. Yep, so, so if I understand 
correctly from you is that uh, the tumor cells will still be expressing higher level of uh, the EGFR, which allow for the targeting of uh, these uh, EGFR targeting RBCEV. Yeah, yeah, for the most part. Okay. Also, this can be applied to any other model because some certain models you have, uh, 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 certain cancer models, you have certain unique or overexpressed markers. So at the end of the day, it comes down to finding either a unique marker to your target cell or finding that it's something that is so highly overexpressed compared to normal cells. So you get preferential targeting. As it is just a model to demonstrate. Yeah. It is where we demonstrate that the engineering approach works using this model. But of course, you can translate it to whatever you want. It's just a matter of finding your target mm. for your application. Yeah. All right. So another question is uh, a more technical question. So how do you avoid the interaction of uh, the strep evidin molecule to other biotin molecules on the surface of uh, RPCED before adding the biotinated antibody? Uh, I think, uh, so let me just get back to that slide. I think it was uh, here. Yeah, so what we see is the streptomidin molecule is tetrameric in nature, but this tetramer in itself is very stable. So you have uh, opposing uh, monomers, which are very tightly bound together. So in the first incubation, you, we do see the streptomidin is bound onto the biotin on the EV. And we, there is always two to three, usually three, the remaining three uh, monomers are free to bind to whatever binding partner that may come by later. So uh, another thing we do uh, in this uh, particular approach is we do know, we have an estimate of the copy number of biotinylated peptide per EV. We put an excess of streptovidin to discourage uh, uh, any sort of oligomerization or like aggregation. So you have a lot more streptovidin than there are biotin, which encourages the binding of one streptovidin binds to one biotin. And the same for the next step, we put an excess of antibody so that the streptovidin doesn't, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So it's a matter of uh, maintaining the reaction psychometry to make sure that we get the outcome we want, where one maximally one binding side of the streptin binds to the biotin on the EV, leaving two or three for the binding to the biotin on the antibody. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely there is uh, some form of uh, optimization on the ratio of uh, the different components, the strep evidin and also the biotin and then the antibody. So moving on yeah. to another question from uh, uh, Ai Jin, Dr. Wang Ai Jin is that, uh, can you elaborate on how you quantify the copies of uh, peptides on each EV and uh, any comments on the accuracy of this method? Exactly that is also the question that I wanted to ask. Okay, uh, I think that was, uh, was that here? Yeah, that was here. So actually, we first did Western blot. We actually got it from, I think, for another paper we, we read, I think, from Dr. Lodish's lab. Uh, so the Western blot here is, it doesn't, sh it doesn't show here, but basically what we do is we would run a Western blot of EVs ligated with a biotinylated form of whichever peptide we wanted to quantify. And we run a biotinylated standard on the same block, uh, standard curve, maybe starting from like one microgram. I'm not sure we have the data in this PPT. Uh, yeah, and we just quantify the relative intensity of the bands in the standard because we know that the standard has a certain number of molecules of biotinylated protein, and we compare that signal to our biotinylated EV. Of course, that is semi-quantitative at best. So the actually I should have labeled this. The graph on the on the middle here, the, this histogram, uh, this shows uh, this is completely linear. So actually, when we submitted the paper, we we repeated the experiment again more quantitatively where we did competition ELISA to quantify the biotin because most of the peptides have only one epitope tag, so we can't use sandwich ELISA. So we ended up doing competition ELISA uh, and quantify the copy number of biotin-related peptides in ligated EVs. Yeah, so bo both, of, both of the estimates do agree for the most part. We get between 300 to 400 for the TL5 and uh, 1,200 to 1,400 for the T140. So is that also the method that you use to quantify the antibodies? For antibody, it was much simpler. Antibodies have multiple epitopes. So I think for the, yeah, this, this experiment, eh, uh, this one, yep. we use yep. sandwich ELISA. It's much simpler. So we like to EV, do sandwich ELISA and quantify how much antibody was, was, was conjugated on the EV. I see, I see. Okay. So another question from uh, Zhongwei. So congrats. And uh, so his question is, uh, do the 
EV surface modification affect the half-life of uh, EVs in vivo and any limit for the extent of modification to avoid any form of uh, immunogenicity? Um, so for the most part, at least in terms of immunogenicity on the short term, we didn't do long term studies. All mm -hmm. our immunogenicity studies were done 24 hours at the most. Of course, mm -hmm. we are injecting human EVs into mice. So we didn't go beyond 24 hours. But within 24 hours, with or without a peptide or VHH, we do not see any upregulation uh, detectable in either in the liver, uh, expression of MRNA in the liver or secretion of inflammatory cytokines in the serum. Uh, the other question was uh, if it's on the half-life. The half -life. We haven't directly tested in this particular study, but we have done it before in our JV paper sometime back where we actually utilized the surface modification approach to increase the half-life. So we were able to ligate a self-peptide. And we saw that upon ligation of the self-peptide, we are able to increase the half life of the yeah, EVs. Let me explain a bit yeah. more. The cell peptide is a fragment of CD47, which is a don't eat me signal. And that's how we uh, can avoid macrophase recognition. And in, in the JEP paper uh, last, that we published last year, we showed that when we conjugate, uh, when we conjugated EV with this peptide, we can increase the half life of the EVs. Uh, by a few minutes. So it's been very short um, because uh, the EV are clear out very quickly by the, the uh, system, the macrophage in the body. And we've been looking for methods to increase this half-life. For uh, immunogenic CD, um, we have tried to use mouse EVs in mice, in mice and we didn't observe any problem with, with that. Um, with protein, on the surface of EVs, um, we will need to make sure that this protein are not immunogenic. Um, so when we apply that to um, clinical trial, we need to have human protein, humanized antibodies. I see. All right. So another question from uh, Norman. Uh, does the recipient of uh, RPC EV has to have a matching blood type with the donor? That's an interesting um, question. Mm. Yes, yes, that's interesting. I think, yes, we do need to match the blood type, just like we do blood transfusion, because um, the, and there, there are antigens on the surface of EVs. We yeah, usually use O minus plus to um, make sure that they are uh, universal, but they still as a type of blood. So I think we had to apply on the rules in blood transfusion to avoid uh, any cross-reaction, any immunogenic problem. I see. So another question from uh, Wang. Uh, notice that the RBCEV contains hemoglobin and uh, the human monocyte cells, H THP1 cells culture with uh, RBCEV also detected hemoglobin. So can you elaborate on uh, whether or not the RBC, RBC EV uh, cause iron overload. Does it cause oh, any form iron of iron overload? overload? Mm. Um, we haven't observed any iron overload in, in our experiment because the amount of EVs that we injected is um, quite moderate in um, is it doesn't show any toxicity in terms of, of iron. Um, we have we have checked um, the spleen and the liver. So when with the, the positive control is that if we inject RBCs at the large volume, we can see iron overload because RBC has a mm. larger volume. Right, but RBC EVs are very small. So if we, we so with the amount that we injected in the mice, we don't observe any problem uh, in the in the spleen and liver with iron overload. All right. So uh, before I go on, yeah, Ken. So do we still have uh, time to go on or? Yeah. Yeah. Let's uh, let's continue. Okay. Thank so you. you... All right. All right. Okay. You, because Ken. we still have uh, a few questions. Yeah. So yes, yes. moving on, another question. Uh, can you please uh, give your point of view about the future direction of EV-based therapy and the obstacles 
that need major attention. The, yeah, I think it's very promising to apply RBCEVs in for, for gene therapy, and that is what um, Kamin Therapeutics is developing. Um, that is why we work with the industry to translate this research. Um, then um, I, I can only tell that in coming therapeutics, um, IBC EV is used to deliver DNA um, with larger size than what we are using here. And this could um, deliver genes that, uh, that replace uh, disease um, causing um, genetic mutation in, and therefore it can be a good therapeutic approach to treat rare diseases um, with genetic problem. Um, for us, we develop a lot of, of RNA therapeutics for cancer, and this could be quite useful because um, we can target any gene using anti cell oligonegotide or sRNA, so we can make it very flexible. We can adapt to new mutation. We're also targeting um, RNA in COVID-19, I mean, SARS-CoV-2, so that we can um, change this sequence whenever the, 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 the virus have new mutation. So this is quite um, promising. And in terms of delivery, RNA EVs has various advantages that I mentioned. Um, the challenge is to how to, um, how to make this go through a clinical trial. I think it's, we have to first demonstrate that this is safe in uh, primate, and um, we believe that this is probably uh, safer than other type of carriers because these are natural EVs produced by our primary cells. Um, but we we have to see when we combine it with um, the payload and also the chemical that we use for for loading for modification. Uh, if this is also very safe, um, so we have to test it in a in a larger animal in order to to ensure the safety and also that how do we um, um, have like enough EVs from donors to produce um, this for therapeutic purpose for clinical trials. Yep. So indeed, I mean, uh, the, there's a huge potential, but they also have uh, multiple challenges to be overcome. So moving on to another question, uh, is a, a more technical question. Have you tested uh, rank one and also exofax against uh, EH operation for larger RNA molecules? Yes, we have tried. Actually, that is the advantage of using uh, these translation reagents. So if you if you go to um, system bioscience website, you can see that they also use it method, the exofax for delivery of plasmid and mRNA. And for us, we show in our um, earlier studies that electroporation can be used for mRNA delivery, but actually um, it's quite challenging because when we increase the voltage of electroporation in order to load mRNA into the EVs, then we can see even la larger extent of aggregation. So in, in our earlier study, uh, we couldn't watch the EV because when we watch the EV with centrifugation, then everything clumped together. With exophage or um, RBC EVs, we could watch the EVs to remove unbound mRNA, and then we can quantify the amount of, of RNA or DNA that are loaded into the EVs. And we can see a better efficiency of this delivery into the cells. All right, so congratulations from uh, Prof Wang, Wang Ai Jin, truly wonderful work. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last question that I'm going to take is, uh, uh, is there naturally uh, expressed CD47, which is the non it signal on this uh, RBC EV? Yes, actually we have shown in our uh, JEV paper last year that there are uh, CD47 47 on RBC EV. So there's quite um, a large amount of CD47 on the surface of EVs, but it's, a comp a, 
is compensated by a lot of uh, food fattening syringe on the EVs as well. That's why this CD47S don't eat me signal uh, had to compete with the eat me signal from the food fattening syringe. All right. So, yeah, so that's all we have. And uh, thank you, everyone, for your questions. And uh, over to you, Ken. Well, this has been very educational for me, and I've really enjoyed the presentation. So thanks to um, to all of you who have presented uh, this morning, this evening for, for some of us around the world. Um, and I, I really appreciate the questions as well from the audience. So thank you all for joining. Wei Xiong, thank you so much for uh, co-hosting and moderating here. And thank you. And very much look forward to, uh, to seeing you again at a future EV club. So thank you. And take care, everybody. Hope you have a great weekend and a good week ahead. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, thank you so you, much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.